so today we're going to be um, we're going to switch gears. So that was a very sort of high level view of limb deficiencies and some complex stuff. I want to bring it back to some basics for you guys. And um, I know that you know when it comes to supracondylar fractures, we see them so often on the PED service. And every time we go through indications conference, it's just type two supracondylar pinned next. Um, there is actually a lot more behind the scenes and things that you guys should appreciate and understand when you're treating these. Um, a lot of controversy too. It can, um, there are a couple areas of supracondylar fractures that are hotly debated um, and uh, very interesting topics for us. Um, so we'll try and get into some of those, but also um, just make sure you guys are comfortable with the very basics, um, especially uh, PGY1s and PGY2s out there um, who maybe haven't done this yet. Um, you know, hopefully you'll get a chance to um, come and do some when you're on call at Mission Bay um, or at the General or, um, and then, you know, eventually at show. And, uh, but I want to make sure you guys are comfortable with everything and please make sure to interrupt me. Um, please ask questions. I would love to hear your voices and um, we'll make sure that you guys understand everything as we go. So we'll talk about, um, and also I cannot really see the chat or anything that well. So if you if you do have questions, just, um, just shout it out. Um, so we're gonna talk about pediatric uh, supracondylar humerus fractures. We're gonna um, talk about diagnosis and treatment and some diagnostic dilemma or some treatment dilemmas. Um, so to start off with, this is, uh, the reason why we talk about it a lot is because it's super common. Um, this is the most common elbow fracture of childhood. It represents about two thirds of all children of all pediatric elbow fractures. And it has a wide spectrum of presentation, right? This is anything from, um, oh, why is my, anything from like an absolute nothing injury, your child's fine, don't worry about it, it's gonna be fine to like a major, you know, possibly limb threatening injury where you can have nerve or blood vessel um, injury, even, you know, in the very, very, very rare case where kids have lost their arms. Um, so uh, it's something that we spend a lot of time talking about. Our, day, our goal today is to review the pathophysiology of su supracondylar fractures, um, review the non-surgical and surgical treatment options um, based on their type and pattern. We'll talk about when to open these. Um, most of the time we just pin them, but there are certainly times when we do need to open. And then we'll review the options for treatment um, of perfuse pulseless supracondylar humerus fractures. So um, first of all, just to, uh, I wanna make sure you guys understand why this injury happens. So can somebody tell me how this happens? Shout it out. The monkey bars. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And what happens when a child falls off the monkey bars? Usually fall onto a, an outstretched arm with usually like their arm kind of locked out. And then they exactly an extension type injury usually. Yeah. So that means that what cracks through what? Uh, what's the what's the what is the mechanism of the bone? Why does the bone break in that spot? You said it outstretched arm. The arm is locked in extension. So what is it that causes the fracture at that level? Usually the thinnest part of the humerus because that's where you have that sort of hourglass and the cortices are coming together. Yes, exactly. It's paper thin. And what hits it? The olecranon process? Yes, the olecranon. So your olecranon, oh shoot, it's just said my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, the olecranon is a fulcrum, right? And it cracks right at that paper thin um, spot. Even in an adult, that area, the olecranon fossa, is, is paper thin. Think about it in a tiny little kid, right? That area is like, is so thin, very easy to break. So that is absolutely the weakest link of the distal humerus. Um, and when the, olecranon, uh, when the olecranon hits it, because you have force extending an already extended elbow, that's where it breaks. So that's why this is extremely common because kids put their, um, their arm out. Um, they typically actually put their left arm out um, or that seems to be the one that's injured more, but either way, it's a, it's a fallen and outstretched arm. Um, as you guys mentioned, it's extremely classically the monkey bars. Um, 
and uh, and hence our supercondylar business has been significantly affected by COVID, um, which shut down monkey bars for months at a time. Um, so the so let's go through type ones, twos, and threes. Somebody tell me what's a type one. Type one is non-displaced. Mm -hmm. Yep, or minimal displacement. Um, and uh, hold on one second. I thought I had a different. Um, yeah, okay, so here we go. Here are pictures. Type one is is non-displaced or minimally displaced. Um, and then what's a type two? Uh, I guess, as you see there, the posterior cortex is um, preserved, but it's mm -hmm. unloaded and um, there's some periosteum intact. Yeah, the posterior cortex is still intact. It's still all in one piece. Um, and uh, the you can see that the, um, the example here on the bottom shows that there's still posterior cortex, it's bent. Um, but it's still connected. And then as opposed to a type three, keep going, Ellen. Yeah, completely displaced uh, with periosteal disruption. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, well, so what, so not quite. You said completely displaced. Yes, the posterior cortex is displaced. But what is it that differentiates a type three and a type four? You mentioned periosteum whether the periosteum is intact. Or... Yeah, so a type three, there may be no posterior cortex attached, but the periosteum is, right? Because what happens when you reduce that arm and you flex it up? It stays, it doesn't go into flexion. Yeah, exactly. So that means the periosteum is still intact. So. Um, just to review, go through all this again, type one is minimal displacement where you still, we'll talk about the anterior humeral line, but that's still going to go through your capitellum. Type two is where the posterior cortex is still intact. Um, and we'll talk about two A's and two B's just to make it a little bit more complicated. Um, type three is where you have the posterior cortex is disrupted. Now the, the x-ray doesn't always look quite as dramatic as the picture that I have here. Um, this, you know, this one, the two pieces are wide apart. It can still be a type three and be much closer together, but the, but the posterior cortex is still disrupted. What makes it a type four is only something we usually find out in the operating room. And that is where we, where we go to reduce the elbow and find that it actually flips into flexion when you, when you flex the elbow up. And that means that the periosteum is also disrupted. So the type three usually still has intact periosteum, which means that when you reduce it, it's stable. All right. Um, so, and just as we said, to make it harder, um, there is a subclassification. So talk to me about the difference between a 2A and a 2B. What do you see in these x-rays? Um, so the distal humerus in the right side is slightly out of plane, which I think is indicating that there's rotational melanoma. Exactly. So um, the right side here, you see that it's not, th this one on the left, is pure extension, right? So if, and I didn't put the coronals up here, but you can imagine that if you looked at a coronal X-ray of, um, of this one on the left, it would look normal. There would not be any varus or valgus, there would not be any rotation. It would look like a normal AP, um, but you just have this pure extension on the lateral. Whereas if you look at the image on the, on the right here, this one, you can see that the medial, the medial cortex, that's, you know, this right here, you guys can see my pointer is the medial side and that is actually swiveled backwards. So there's rotation um, in addition to the extension. And that means that even though it's a, it's a type two, it's a type two B. And the reason that this is important is because it may have implications on how you can treat it, okay? Um, and then also there's a three A and a three B. Um, now this is, this is only, this is not necessarily important in how you're gonna treat it, but it is important in what you're gonna pay attention to um, on your preoperative exam. And so if you have a, so somebody tell me about the displacement of a 3A. You can see it. <laughs> apex lateral, basically. Exactly, it's apex lateral. So the distal fragment is displaced medially. So it's post, we call this posterior medial displacement. And that means that you put, that you have what kind of nerve injury? Radial. Thank you, Will. 
Um, and Will, so what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that, you can see the kind of a posterior lateral displacement. Yeah, usually, yeah, usually you can see this on the x-ray. And the reason you want to pay attention to it um, is because you want to be like kids can be very hard to get good exams on, right? So you have to you have to be so careful with your pre-op exam. And especially if you have a you know very displaced 3A, you want to really make sure that you get that kid to straighten their thumb, right? Um, and as opposed to if you have the 3B, which is more common. Um, then you're really paying more attention to the pulse and the median nerve. Now you're always paying all attention to all of these things, but you're sort of going to focus extra amounts on making sure that they can, you know, if you're worried about the 3B, you want to make sure that they can bend the DIP of their uh, index finger and the FPL um, and that they can flex up the, the IP joint of their thumb. Um, so, and, and just while we're talking about sort of doing a good exam, I want to really um, harp on you guys to make sure that you're accurate. So kids are very difficult to examine and you can't say, you know, you can't necessarily tell them what to do, especially if you've got a three-year-old who's in pain and who's terrified and who doesn't want to be there and is who, they're hungry and you're never going to get a good exam. So you just have to be patient. You have to be sort of strategic um, and you also have to be very specific. So I always, I'll just hold, um, if you guys can see me, I, I'll just hold the finger, their index finger for a while. And I'll just sit there and wait for them to flicker um, the, you know, the, the DIP joint of their index finger. And same thing, I'll just hold their thumb and I'll wait for them to bend at the IP joint. They may be, you know, they may be able to follow commands, they may not, but eventually you'll probably be able to see some motion. Um, the sensory exam may be a little bit tricky, um, but you always, you always should be able to get a good motor exam. And, you know, I'm always testing the, uh, isolating the DIP joint of the small finger to check that their ulnar nerve is working. Um, usually you can get them to, uh, to fire their um, fire their intrinsics and then checking their IP joint of the thumb and their DIP joint of the index finger and then their FPL and their EIP. So um, usually you can get those things to work um, and, but you really wanna focus on doing a very good exam in a child. It can be hard. Um, so, and then um, one thing to note also it is flexion type injuries. These are rare um, and they, we don't see them as much, but when we do see them, it's a pain in the butt. And I wanna make sure you guys understand the difference between um, like a type four and a flexion type injury. Those two, those things are different. So an extension type injury can be a type four where it's unstable in flexion and extension, but a flexion injury actually typically presents um, in flexion. So it's a different mechanism. They typically land on the back of their arm. So it's not the normal fall on an outstretched arm. Um, and these are different because they are harder. They're rare, um, um, but, they're, but they also rarely have vascular complications. So that's good, but they do have high ulnar nerve complications. And so those are things you really wanna look out for. Um, and these also, you know, we almost sort of expect that we're gonna have to open them um, so it's important when you're counseling families to, you know, when you're talking to them in the emergency department, you know, sort of what you're preparing them for. If it's a very, you know, not too bad of a type three, you can, you know, sort of say, you know, it's very likely that we're going to get this closed. It would be very unlikely for us to have to do, for us to have to open anything. Um, as opposed to if you have this kind of flexion type injury, you will really want to get the family prepared for the fact that their child may have a, you know, an incision and have a longer surgery. Um, but luckily, this you don't have the vascular complications in these flexion types, but they are they are difficult. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about some of the radiographic parameters, just so you guys know what you're looking at on the X-rays. Um, so, what is this line called? Here, here, my line. Yes, the anterior humeral line. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I also just drew this one, this line as a reminder, right, that no matter what, we always look at the radio capitella joint and make sure it's aligned as well. Not to confuse you guys, this is not the lecture where we're talking about radio capitella alignment, but just a few different um, lines that we pay attention to in the elbow. The anterior humeral line um, should bisect the capitellum. So this is a very good lateral x-ray here. Um, and you can see that the anterior humeral line comes and basically divides the capitellum in half. So, so this, um, this x-ray in the bottom right, you can see that the anterior humeral line completely misses 
the capitellum in this kid. Um, and it is really important to get a good lateral x-ray. So somebody tell me, how would you assess the anterior humor line in, in, this, um, in this injury? What do you, what do you, how would you classify this one? That looks more like an oblique, oblique image. So I probably would want to get a better lateral. Good. Yes. Thank you. Because if you just looked at this and said, oh, it's a lateral x-ray and the anterior humeral line doesn't touch the capitellum, you would be falsely convicting this um, patient to a surgery. Um, so really important to make sure that you see this image um, as your lateral x-ray, see that hourglass, because on this kid, you know, I said, you know, no, it's not a good lateral, just, you know, get, or actually that, that image was actually part of a, to a tomogram. And so you can see that as you scroll through the tomogram, you actually have a very minimally displaced or non-displaced fracture essentially. Um, so it's extremely important to get a good view. Um, and it can be challenging because kids don't sit well for x-rays in the emergency department, you know, they're in pain. Um, it's really hard for the posi to position them. The x-ray techs and the ED will, you know, sort of try and say like, oh no, they can't get another x-ray. And you say, actually, yes, they need another x-ray. It needs to be a good one because we're making surgical decisions based off of this. Um, so please get good x-rays. Um, and then another thing that's very important to look at is Bauman's angle. So this is sort of a you know general assessment of varus and valgus. Um, the way that we measure it is by a line on the, on the AP x-ray, a line down the humeral shaft um, in relation to the line um, obliquely drawn through the, um, the capitellum growth center. And there is a pretty wide variation on this. So, um, you know, it can, the, I think the normal range is between 64 and 81. Um, if there's, you know, and this, this will tell you, obviously, if it's, if it's a higher number, if it's closer to 90, that's an elbow and varus. Um, if it's a much lower number, then that's an elbow and valgus. Um, and we don't really want it either way. Um, so if you have any questions, if it doesn't, if it doesn't look right, or if you're, you know, if we're thinking, oh yeah, this is just a tight two way, we might be able to just flex the kid um, and treat them in a cast. You want to make sure you're paying attention to Bauman's angle and making sure you're not going to leave them in varus or valgus. So if you have any questions, you can always compare it to the other side. They should be symmetric. Um, and we especially want to avoid varus, right? Because that's a pretty ugly deformity to have. Um, so there's your Bauman's angle drawn in on that x-ray. So we'll talk a little bit about when to treat non-operatively for these. Um, first, we talk about the, the type 0.5, right? So these are, ex these are actually um, where we can't even see a fracture, but there's an elbow fusion. And we won't go into this too much, but we know that from literature based on follow-up x-rays that anywhere from 20 to 80% of these kids who have a normal elbow x-ray plus an effusion will have a, uh, will actually have a supracondylar fracture. So we have a pretty low threshold to treat these kids in a cast. Um, but those are definitely kids that we're not going to operate on if you can't even see a fracture line. Likewise, the type one, if it's non-displaced or just very minimally displaced, um, then we also can treat it in a cast. Um, and then we, you know, talked about the type two A where it's pure extension. Um, if it's a super young kid and it's just a little bit extended, you could argue to just treat that in a cast. Um, you know, especially if it is sort of just glance, if it just sort of, um, uh, barely touches the capitellum um, because there may be, there is probably some remodeling in the super young kids. Um, or also you have the opportunity to just do a closed reduction in the emergency department. So you flex them up and then lower it down and, um, and hold them in a cast at 90. Um, but those are certainly, you know, those are, um, it is a bit debatable. Everybody has their own preferences. Um, and uh, there, it's sort of a case by case um, basis of whether or not we would treat a type two with um, a closed treatment in a cast. They may have questions about that, it sort of comes up often. Um, but uh, um, what I really wanna underscore is that never, never, never do we do hyperflexion casting. Um, the, uh, you know, this is something that used to be done um, many, many years ago and is still done in um, uh, developing nations. Uh, and they have a major problem with ischemic contractures um, because hyperflexion casting is extremely dangerous for causing compartment syndromes and a Volkmann's ischemic contracture. Um, and then let's just talk a little bit about these long arm casts. Um, I wanna make sure that you guys are putting on good casts and you know, try and make sure that you guys um, get some good 
cast education and we'll do some casting at the um, cadaver session um, in a couple of weeks, but somebody tell me what's wrong with this cast. Too short and too wide at the top. Thank you. That do, does that immobilize your elbow? No way. You can see that that would just piston or would just rock back and forth and is not going to immobilize an elbow. Um, likewise, this pink one here, too short, um, that is just at, at risk for not stabilizing um, an elbow fracture, especially one that is a flexion and extension type injury. Um, this one is a little bit better on the length. I think you could still go a little higher, but look at these fingers, right? Somebody's casted their fingers. Please leave the children's fingers available so that they can play their video games. Um, and uh, and then this one is, is much better, right? So even though I, this is some kind of weird splint or plaster something, um, it's much higher up in the armpit uh, and the fingers are all um, are all out and accessible. So this is a much better um, splint or cast to uh, emulate. Um, and then the rest of the cases we'll be treating operatively. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the reduction maneuver. Um, would somebody like to describe how we reduce a type three? Sure. Yeah, first maneuver is unhook with a little bit of posterior force, then traction, and then flexion with traction. Yeah, perfect. So just as we've drawn here, um, and I, this is normally where I go around the room and I put my hands on you guys and, and, I, and I pull on your elbows. Um, but we always, and keep in mind, we're always pulling with a bent elbow, right? So you're never going to straighten the elbow out and pull traction. Um, that's dangerous because you've got these very sharp bone spikes. Um, in the front of the arm, which can um, shear blood vessels and nerves and things like that. Um, so yes, as Laura mentioned, you can you can sort of push it down, push it posterior a little bit, and that tends to unhinge things. And then pull traction with a with a bent elbow, and then sort of come up and around and flex the elbow. And that um, after you know sometimes you have to do that a few times in order to get it all the way reduced. Um, but that should once you get the elbow flexed. Um, it should uh, hold it pretty uh, stable for you. So again, the one thing I don't like about this picture is that it shows pulling traction through, it looks like an extended elbow. So keep in mind, we're not ever extending the elbow, um, and, uh, but you are pulling traction and then you push, pushing sort of a posterior force on the olecranon um, or, and on the back of the humerus as you, as you push it up and come into flexion. And then we tend to hold the arm in pronation. Um, that tends to be the more stable position. Um, and then, oh, just one thing, this is also called the milking maneuver, right? So the milking maneuver is only for very displaced type three fractures. Um, and that is because the bone of the humerus often pokes through the brachialis. And so it can actually be sort of buttonholed and stuck through. So you're trying to sort of milk the bone out of the brachialis um, when, you, when you find you have a really displaced one where the bone edge is right at the skin. Um, and so that's a maneuver to sort of disentangle the soft tissues from the bone. Um, in terms of the OR setup, um, we usually use a radiolucent arm board. There are some people who set the arm up on the C-arm, but um, I find that the arm board just gives you more flexibility. Um, there, are, there are many cases where um, when, you, when you have the arm flexed up like this, um, everything is stable. When, when you rotate it, that actually rotates the fracture. And so there may be cases where you actually can't rotate the arm and therefore have to rotate the C-arm. And for that reason, I always do mine on a radiolucent table and have the C-arm um, mobile so that you can rotate the C-arm as opposed to using the C-arm as a table. Um, you always wanna bring the patient all the way to the edge of the table. So these are little kids, so they've got little arms and you wanna make sure that you're out of the way of any metal from the table. Um, and then because you're bringing them all the way over, just be very careful to restrain them, make sure their head doesn't fall off the table, make sure their bodies don't fall off the table because these are little tiny people. Um, and then when we have a type two, we're typically going to use two, sometimes three um, divergent pins. And can somebody tell us what do I mean by divergent? Could spread across the fracture site. Yeah, and that's key that the spreading is occurring at the fracture site, right? So, um, and I'll, uh, I think I mentioned later that that spread at the fracture site should be at least 1.3 centimeters. Um, and obviously we can't measure that exactly on fluoro, but there should be a good amount of spread. 
Um, and you're really trying to get, you know, something over in the medial side and also something up the lateral cortex. So um, having a widespread is, uh, is gonna give you a more stable construct. So this is just an example of a type two. Um, we put two pins in and you can see, we, we, we also try and start them relatively anterior. So you get a little bit more, um, uh, more real estate. If you start them sort of more distal towards the capitellum, then you have a longer um, trajectory of the pin inside the bone, um, as opposed to starting it way back where you're gonna get a little bit less um, bony uh, real estate. Um, and then after the case, we always look at the um, elbow inflection and extension to make sure that the fracture, the fracture is not still rocking. Um, in terms of the pin selection, um, I use 062 K wires for most of the little kids, but once they get over 20 kilograms, then we tend to go up towards the two millimeters or even rarely in 2.4 millimeter K wires, but usually it's either an 062 or a two millimeter K wire. Um, and this just shows the ideal pin spread, right? So ideally you want um, one pin that hits over here in the medial metaphysis and one pin that goes up the lateral column. Um, and then also this pin through the center is excellent because how many cortices does that have? Four. Four, thank you. Um, when you go in, uh, you go through your first cortex and then you go through the fossa twice and then you go through the final cortex. So that pin gets four cortices of strength. Um, and it's and it's great if you can get one nicely just straight through the olecranon fossa. Um, and then this is a this is a don't do this slide, right? So this is a kid I saw like two weeks out from their surgery. They a foot and ankle community doc fixed this and um, don't be this person. So just remember diverge. Um, this these pins crossed right at the fracture, um, and uh, so it didn't hold anything stable. And then also, you know, note the splint that they put on. Um, it only, it, you know, barely went up. The kid was like rocking in the, in the splint. Um, kids don't take care of splints very well. So that's why we put them in casts because a kid will unravel an ace wrap in like a day. Um, don't trust them. So I got to cast them up. Um, and then this one, you can see when we actually took it to the OR, the uh, anterior humeral line didn't didn't touch the capitellum, so we revised and just put a couple more pin um, and put new pins in, and and it moved nicely. Um, we talked about the 1.3 centimeters of spread at the fracture site, so there was a study that showed that if the spread was at least that much, then the fracture did better. Um, type threes we usually treat with three pins. Um, and typically, those are all lateral just because of the ease of placement and and less risk. Um, so again, we're trying to get you know a pin over in the medial column and then a pin at the lateral column and um, one or two pins through the fossa. So these pins, as you can see, they're actually divergent in both planes, which is ideal. If they cross in one plane at the fracture, they cross at the fracture. Um, so if you have pins that are crossing on the lateral, even though they're divergent on the AP, that's still not good. Um, and then there are some cases where we end up having to place a medial pin. Um, these tend to be the cases with more comminution. So if you have a fracture that's comminuted and is trying to tip into varus or valgus, then um, you may uh, benefit by having a medial pin for that extra stability. Um, and then, you know, we, we talk about, um, there is some literature on the biomechanics of lateral versus a lot, lateral plus a medial pin. Um, and technically, biomechanically, you know, the, the medial pin does add some torsional and bending stiffness, but it's actually usually not necessary. So um, in most cases, there is completely sufficient fixation with just lateral pins even though your medial pin does add um, to stability. So the reason that we don't do it is because the lateral pins are just so easy, right? There's nothing there. You just feel your capitellum. You've got a safe shot and you can put it in without worrying about where your, where your pin start site is. Um, the medial pins have a significantly higher incidence of ulnar nerve injury um, and a slightly higher incidence of any nerve injury but we, we really do worry about ulnar nerve problems um, with a medial pin. So if you are gonna do a medial pin, you do it carefully. First, we put the lateral pins in to give the fracture some amount of stability. Um, and then you may or may not choose to make a small medial incision where you're gonna put your medial pin. I usually do just so I can get like a schnitt and spread down, place a, and I have them open a small frag set so they can get the soft tissue protector and put that down on the medial, um, on the medial side. 
Um, you tend to start a little bit more anterior, right? Because your ulnar nerve is going to be wrapping around the back of the um, of the medial epicondyle. And so at least you want to be sort of on the epicondyle or a little on the anterior side of it. Um, and then we also tend to uh, pin put, place that pin in relative extension so that you don't have the ulnar nerve um, trying to come anterior when you have the elbow highly flexed. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about is um, when we get supracondylar fractures in older kids. So sometimes, uh, you know, you get a nine-year-old with a supracondylar fracture and your attending's going to go, what? <laughs> like, you know, this is a, this is like a, a three to, to seven-year-old kid injury. Um, the, the kids who fall outside of that might be something a little bit different. So with the little kids, with the really little babies, we worry more about like um, physeal separations and that kind of injury. Um, with, the, with the older kids, these are fractures that tend to be much harder. Um, these are higher energy mechanisms just because their bone is harder and, um, and more solid and harder to break. Um, so that a higher energy fracture tends to be harder to fix. Um, and then the displacement or lack thereof can be really deceptive. Sometimes these really, really unstable fractures are actually not very displaced. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, these are more likely to be uh, open injuries or intraarticular. And so we might have a lower threshold to get a CT scan if there's any question of whether or not there's a fracture line that propagates into the, um, into the joint line. Um, we may use more pins, we might use bigger pins, we might even turn to open plating for these. Um, and we also expect more post-op stiffness. So everything about a supracondylar and a kid who's like 9, 10, 11, um, we're, we're not excited about. Um, so this is an example of a 14-year-old boy who fell from a rope, a rope swing onto rocks. So this was actually not an extension injury at all. It was a sort of a flexion or, or, or compression injury um, and it was very impacted. So even though this looks like it's not so bad, um, based on the CT scan, uh, it, was, it was impacted. Um, and there was also a fracture line that went down um, into the joint. What's that? Oh, sorry, I thought I heard something. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, so uh, there was a fracture line that went into the joint um, and it was impacted. So we ended up having to open this. Now it was still um, not super displaced. So I was able to treat it with pins um, and, it, and, it, um, and it came together nicely, but this was one really on the cusp of, you know, should I have opened and plated it? Um, anyway, this one did fine. This was another one that, you know, doesn't look so bad. And I think, I think when the resident called me about this one, they were like, can we just treat it in a cast? And this, again, this is not a normal supracondylar fracture. This is a type four. Um, and these ones where they just rest like right underneath it um, are really hard. So this is actually, um, even though you look at this and you're like, oh, it's not so bad. Um, this was a hard one and ended up needed to be opened as well. Because when we flexed it, um, you could see that it's unstable inflection and there's gapping in the back. Um, and so this one was opened and pinned. Um, and then, of course, there are the true adult type injuries, right? This was actually, I kid you not, my first case of being an attending. Um, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And it was open. That was the best part. Um, and uh, so anyway, sometimes we actually have to treat um, kids as adults. And so uh, I think I, I lost like five gallons of sweat um, during this case. It's stressful enough to be an attending, let alone doing this as your first case. But um, anyway, we treat this one as an adult. Luckily, when kids break their bones in these teeth, condylar fractures, they're like these beautiful, nice pieces that just go right back together. So it ends up sort of being a, a layup. But um, in terms of uh, open treatment, you know, the vast majority um, of these supercondylars can be treated closed with pins. One thing, one thing we also have to keep in our back of our minds is we're judged on, based on how much we avoid opening these. So somebody who's going to open many supracondylars is actually going to get dinged on the US News and World Report. So this is a metric that they follow. So it's important that we do everything we can to treat these closed. Um, and then, uh, you know, when we are opening, it's not for hardware, right? It's for alignment and also for exploration of blood vessels. So we'll just um, talk. Sorry, I've been talking way too long, um, but uh, I'll try and get through some of this stuff too. So who gets the formal open exploration? Um, obviously, a disvascular hand gets an emergent open exploration and repair with low threshold for fasciotomies. So a disvascular hand is a white hand or 
you know, or even just something without normal cap refills. So if the cap refill is four seconds, that's not normal, that's dysvascular, that's an emergency, that's where you call in vascular surgery or plastics or, or whoever it is. Um, but those are very much emergent. Um, and then also the other people who get formal explorations are, are those who, you know, you can't, you can't get the arm reduced. So you can't get the elbow reduced. So sometimes there's too much stuff in the way and you have to go in and you have to make sure that that's not an artery um, or a nerve. Um, so this is a dreaded consequence of your reduction. So think about how, you know, you're, you're doing this closed maneuver um, and there's a lot of really important stuff, right? Tiger country, right in front of the, right in front of the humerus. And so there are these cases where you could theoretically trap the blood vessel or nerve in the fractures or reducing it. This is a picture from a paper that discussed um, this, uh, this complication. And this, uh, this reduction here, which doesn't look that bad, um, but it was, a, it was somebody who had a nerve deficit beforehand. So pre-op had a nerve deficit. And then they did this reduction, which was not perfect. Um, but anyway, the nerve didn't come back and they explored it and they found the nerve in that fracture. So if it's, if there's any kind of deficit beforehand, um, and you can't get a perfect reduction or if that reduction feels squishy, um, then definitely have a low threshold to make a small opening and explore. So when we talk about pink pulse lists, right? So this is, this is a, this is actually happens not, um, not uh, not uncommonly, we we get you know kids with a bad two, the bad type three, and they have a nice you know well perfused hand with normal cap refill, but you can't feel a pulse. That is a pulseless arm, and we have to treat it as its own classification of, of pink perfused, um, but pulseless supracondylar fracture. So these are extremely. This is where all the controversy in supracondylar fractures is, um, and there is liter there's literature to support anything you want. You can back yourself up to explore everyone. Um, you can, you know, there's papers to, su to suggest that you should only explore if there's a pre-op nerve deficit. There are papers to suggest that you should explore if the pulse doesn't come back in 30 minutes after reduction. There are also plenty of papers to suggest that people do fine, so don't open them. Um, so you would think, you know, why, why should you explore everyone? And there, um, when people have actually looked at the ones that do get open, um, in like in some uh, settings where they like open and explore all of these and look at the blood vessel, they've actually reported pretty high incidences of real arterial injury. So things where you have a thrombosis in the brachial artery or an intimal tear, um, you know, laceration is pretty uncommon. We don't tend to see that, but these, these, my, these more subtle injuries like the intimal tear or the, or a pseudoaneurysm or a, or a thrombosis, um, those are, those do happen. And the papers that talk about, you know, all the ones that they open suggest that they actually happen in, a, in um, a reasonable number of them. So some people would argue that, you know, we usually describe this as vasospasm and we say, oh, it's just in spasm, it's going to come back. Um, and many people would say, actually, the spasm is overemphasized and there's probably a higher rate of real arterial injury. Um, but on the other, in the other camp, is there you any have- Is there for um, like vascular studies that can- distinguish between like a spasm and a real injury rather than exploring everyone? Um, so you, we don't tend to do that in the OR. So certainly never pre-op, okay? So, and that's been a board question and on the OITE, you know, is there, there's never an indication to do a vascular study on a, on a, on a poorly perfused or a pink pulseless elbow before going to the OR. Never, never, never. Just go to the OR, reduce it. It's it's almost always going to come back. And at least like 70% of these, the pulse just comes back with reduction. So never beforehand. Um, sometimes if there's something that you're, if there's one of these that's a little bit weird, um, like I've done it on one kid um, in a case where they had a pulse pre-op and then when we reduced it, they did not have a pulse. Um, we opened her and there was like no evidence of injury, but the Doppler was still abnormal. And in those weird situations, then yes, you can do vascular studies. Typically we do them post-op. Um, and our vascular surgeons are typically pretty hands-off about that kind of thing, saying like, no, this is fine. It's just going to be fine. <laughs> um, and so, but in terms of why not to explore everyone, so think about, look at this, this picture over here on your right. Um, brachial artery obviously is the main highway of blood flow to the hand, 
but there is very rich collateral flow around the elbow. Um, and so uh, many people would argue that all that collateral flow is actually plenty to rely on. Um, and you don't need your brachial artery because you've got all these other ways to get down to the hand. So if let's say there is a real brachial artery injury, um, thrombosis, you then really don't want to disturb any of that collateral flow. So if you go in there and open things up and muck around, then you may actually be compromising the collateral flow that you so desperately are relying on at that time. Um, and brachial artery repairs are not that successful in kids. I mean, there, there is, there's some success, but it's a giant surgery and there are a lot, there's a high rate of restenosis. Um, and so if you don't, you know, you prefer not to screw up the collateral flow because kids will do fine if they just have collateral flow. Um, so you really don't want to worsen the ischemia by damaging the collateral flow. And that's one of the biggest reasons not to just go ahead and open everybody willy nilly. Um, you can also destabilize the fracture, right? And obviously, you know, you rely on that periosteum that's still intact. Um, and uh, you don't want to um, destabilize your fracture because this, you know, also destabilizing the fracture will not be as good for the soft tissues. Um, and, you know, another reason to not open everybody is because the long-term outcomes are fantastic. Um, we don't have, we don't have any evidence that, you know, shows that kids who don't get open do worse than kids that do. Um, so I guess that I just wanted to show a couple of examples if, if you do have to open. So there are a couple options, you know, and doing uh, an incision, um, you know, can be different in different cases. So this is a, you know, these, um, this is a great AP x-ray. These ones that are so displaced in the coronal plane, these ones have a very high risk of needing to be opened. Um, and so this is a, a case where that was the pre-op x-ray. Um, we then did the reduction and then the bottom left fluoro shot, that's as good as we could get it. Um, and so clearly there's something in the way that's preventing it from, from going back together. That's not a reduction that you're going to be satisfied with. So in this case, I wasn't worried about the vascularity so much, but I was worried about the alignment. And so you can see the, the, the dotted lines, right? So that's the typical incision that you can do this, the S-shape incision all the way across the antecubital fossa. But it's very easy just to make the small, like proximal medial limb of that incision and just put your finger in. Um, and you always wanna make sure that you're opening it on the side where the bone spike is, right? Where the metaphyseal spike is, cause that's where the periosteum is gonna be disrupted. On this, um, in this case, if you had opened on the lateral side, you would have found all completely intact periosteum. That is stuff you don't want to disturb. So the medial side is where everything's blown to bits and that's where you just make a skin incision and all of a sudden you're, you've got your finger down on bone. So that's the side you want to open on. Um, and in this case, you know, we just put our finger in and, um, and then we're able to line everything up and pin it and, um, and it came back together. Now, so this is that, um, that incision that you can use if you need to. Proximally, we typically go medially. We come across transversely at the level of the fracture. And then if you need to, you can extend it distally laterally. So this is the classic S-shape incision over the antecubital fossa. Um, this is, you know, there's a lot of anatomy here, right? Your, your bone might be poking through your brachialis um, or your biceps. And, um, and then you have your brachial artery and your median nerve over here. But keep in mind that your anatomy can be anywhere. Your, your brachial artery might be on the lateral side of your bone. This stuff gets so shifted. So you just have to be extremely cautious when you open that things are not going to be where you expect them. And it's gonna be such a you know, blown up um, uh, territory that it's gonna be really hard to recognize things. So um, I've even been in the OR with, with Latanza and you know, she and I are both searching for the brachial artery for like an hour before we found it. I mean, it's not, um, things are not uh, as easy um, as you would like them to be. And then sometimes the, the anatomy makes its incision for you. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, with this one, this is going to be open and washed out as well. So, um, just, oh gosh, we're, we're kind of getting close to out of time, but, um, you know, just to, I know this, this can be, this is not always obvious. Um, so, so what are you going to do if in general, if they're not perfectly pink, like if there's not one to two cap refill, one to two second cap refill, explore them all. If there's any question of vascularity, it gets opened and somebody looks at the artery and you put the Doppler on the artery and you might use papaverine or you might have astrosurgery come in. 
um, but you, you should explore those. If they are perfectly perfused with a good Doppler bowl signal all the way down, then you can just watch these. You've got loads of, um, of research to suggest that if it has a good Doppler signal, you are fine to watch it. These get better. The pulse is back by the first post-op visit. It's fine. Um, and then if they have the poor Doppler signal, even though even if they're totally well perfused, these are ones you still really worry about, right? So we tend to say that we want to leave the OR with a normal Doppler signal. Um, you might warm the room up, warm the patient, wait for a little while, and hopefully that Doppler signal will come back. But these are, again, the one you really worry about not opening them and having blood flow problems, but you also worry about opening them and disturbing the collateral flow. So it's not an easy decision. Um, this is sort of a good general um, uh, decision tree. Um, it's not perfect and it's a little bit vague, but, um, but this is something that you can um, use as like a general guideline. We've also, we're also developing um, these pre-op protocols um, and, uh, um, so, which I don't think we have a lot of time to get into, but it's, you know, basically, uh, deciding, you know, how urgent does this have to be? Um, you know, keeping in mind these real life metrics that we have to go by, right. With the U S news and world report dinging us, if it's more than 18 hours from the time that, um, that we get them to the, uh, that they come to the hospital. Um, and, but, you know, one thing I also wanted to do, um, and we'll just wrap up now, um, but one of our initiatives, uh, initiatives of the diversity committee um, has been to, and I hope, I hope that this has been um, happening for you guys in your core lectures, because we, we've been trying to remind people um, that we always want to be thinking about like disparities in orthopedics and um, and you know, this is a very important part. It shouldn't just be the physiology and the anatomy, but it should also be the disparities. And so we want to make sure that this is part of the education of any topic in orthopedics. Um, and one thing that is definitely an issue is disparities in childhood fractures. This is something that has you know, some literature behind it, more and more coming out, and we're really understanding that, it, that, that injury doesn't affect all kids in the same way. Um, so just as something to end on, I just wanted to highlight a couple of papers that have looked at, you know, disparities in, in pediatric fractures. Obviously, childhood injury is a major um, cause of preventable, mor preventable morbidity. Um, and these injuries disproportionately affect socioeconomically dis disadvantaged fractures or, sorry, disadvantaged families. And there are some, you know, there's some, um, uh, some things that they point to in these papers why that, you know, why that might be. Um, fractures in general are becoming, you know, more common over time, and the the risk um, throughout the decades has sort of been similar. That the more disadvantaged you are, the more higher risk you are for fractures. Um, there was a study that looked at um, uh, fracture rates in um, Washington D.C. neighborhoods, and um, you know they found that race and education factors, as well as family size, were important in fracture rates, and so. Um, kids from dis, you know, from um, or race and educational backgrounds significantly predicted, you know, the the incidence of fractures. Um, you can imagine that at a personal level, like the the person level, these are they might be due, this might be due to decreased bone health, due to physical inactivity, less involvement in organized sports, um, poor nutrition, um, vitamin deficiencies. We see um, decreased vitamin D levels in darker skinned kids um, and limited sun exposure. Um, and then also at a community level. So the parks where kids play are very different, right? There's some that are, you know, have all the, the soft, um, you know, sort of uh, fall friendly um, surfaces as opposed to concrete, um, different activities that are available for kids. And then there are some neighborhoods where kids are getting in accidents more than they're getting, you know, as opposed to the sports injuries. Um, and then large family size and lack of parental supervision is important. And actually there, you know, it's been shown that, that being supervised by your grandparent or your, or your sibling is actually a risk for fracture as well. So um, just to, you know, always wanna make sure that we include um, uh, issues of disparities in the kids that we treat, because it's certainly an important part of, um, of how we're gonna treat the kids.